The famous English writer, Oscar Wilde, came 4,000 miles to Mississippi. It cost him a boat ticket and two weeks' time. In 1882, the famous New York minister, Henry Ward Beecher, came 1,000 miles to Mississippi. It cost him a railroad ticket and three days' time. And in 1882, this infamous man came only 400 miles to Mississippi. It almost cost him his life. Wanted in seven states, dead or alive. A $10,000 reward on his head. But Jesse James risked his life, left his hideout in St. Joseph, Missouri. Rode 400 dangerous miles to the south. Leaving Missouri, passing through Arkansas, down to Mississippi City, Mississippi. What drew a writer, a preacher, and an outlaw to this remote place? They all came to see the Boston strong boy, John L. Sullivan, challenged for the heavyweight championship of the world. This is the man Sullivan has to beat, bare-knuckle champion Irish Paddy Ryan. Wax on his mustache, but iron in his fists. On February 8, 1882, Irish Paddy stalked into the ring to, as he put it, dispense with this boy Sullivan. For eight rounds, Sullivan and Ryan clubbed away at each other. Then suddenly in the ninth round, the upstart challenger smashed his fist to Ryan's jaw and John L. Sullivan became the new bare-knuckle champion of the world. Two months after the fight, Robert Ford shot Jesse James in the back of the head while Jesse was hanging a picture in his home in St. Joseph, Missouri. 1882. America was in the second half of a 200-year boom that would take it from a weakling colony to world power. Football had just been invented, and baseball pitchers were still throwing underhand. Boxing was illegal in most of the country, but Americans loved it. It was the spectator sport, Americana in the raw. Calling the 1882 brand of boxing a sport is really a kindness. Barely organized mayhem would be closer. Bouts were held in bar rooms, on barges, and deep in the backwoods. Wrestling and gouging were commonplace with no gloves on the hands. The brawls also had no time limits. They usually ended with the stronger man having literally disabled his opponent. And in 1882, John Lawrence Sullivan had proved that he could probably, as he put it, lick any son of a bitch in the world. At five foot 10 inches, he was not quite a giant, but in his first seven years as champion, Sullivan overwhelmed all of his 23 opponents in six rounds or less. He drank under the table all those men he didn't fight. Here is John L. without his handlebar mustache, posed in front of his favorite hangout, a saloon. But in 1888, a threat appeared in Sullivan's rosy future. Jake Kilrain who figured he could easily beat the rum-soaked champion. The Sullivan-Kilrain fight is the most famous bare-knuckle contest ever held. 
These are the first photographs ever taken of a fight. These are the only photographs of a bare-knuckle contest. These are the only visual records of John L. Sullivan in action. 23rd round, middle of the Mississippi woods. Temperature 100 degrees. The roughneck crowd didn't have to pay. All the money to be made on the fight was in the $10,000 side bet between Sullivan and Kilrain. The man with the shaved head is the world wrestling champion and Sullivan's trainer, Wild William Muldoon. Notice John L's gloveless right hand. By the way, they are not fighting on canvas, but on good old American dirt. 75th round. Two hours and 16 minutes after it began, the savage fighting ends under the broiling Mississippi sun. Jake Kilrain lies on the ground, too battered to rise. The great Sullivan Kilrain fight is over. It will be the last championship fight fought with bare knuckles. Soon after the fight, the victorious Sullivan had a surprise in store for him. It took 16 brave men in blue to arrest the feared champion for having engaged in an illegal prize fight. In 1890, at the age of 32, the champion took his fistic talents to a new arena, the melodrama stage. John L. and his handlebar mustache starred in a standing room only success called Honest Hearts and Willing Hands. Sullivan, on the left, always got to flatten the dastardly villain in the last act. As John L. moonlighted on the stage, a handsome pompadoured figure catapulted into the boxing limelight, James John Corbett, the father of modern boxing. Corbett arrived on the fight scene at an opportune time. A new set of rules sponsored by the English nobleman, the Marquis of Queensbury, had been gradually gaining favor. The bare-knuckle era was about to end. When James J. Corbett and John L. Sullivan donned gloves on September 7, 1892, it was the start of the modern era of boxing. This crude drawing is the only record of the scene, the Olympic Sporting Club in New Orleans. No photos exist, but evidently it wasn't much of a contest. Sullivan didn't have wrestler Muldoon to get him in shape, and he looked as if he had trained for a pie-eating contest rather than a championship fight. For 20 rounds, the will-o'-the-wisp Corbett danced around the champion, waiting for the opportunity to strike. In the 21st round, with Sullivan reduced to a puffing, exhausted shell, the opening came. John L. Sullivan toppled to the floor. And James John Corbett, the man who is credited with bringing science to the manly art of fisticuffs, stood victorious over America's idol, the invincible John L. Sullivan. The newspapers trumpeted the fall of Sullivan to an unbelieving country. But almost simultaneously with the end of the bare knuckle era, this retiring New Jerseyite inadvertently caused an equally profound change in the fight world. Thomas Alva Edison had invented the kinetograph camera, designed to take 32 still pictures a second, thus creating the illusion of motion. Edison built this black tar-papered laboratory called the Black Mariah to house his camera. In this strange structure, Edison made the very first motion picture. Here it is. Edison soon found that the sneeze was looked upon as a sideshow gimmick. Being an enthusiastic boxing fan, he decided to film something of far greater public interest, a prize fight. He hired world heavyweight champion Gentleman Jim Corbett, who is facing the camera, to oppose the New Jersey champion Peter Courtney. The film of their fight, taken over 70 years ago by Thomas Edison himself, is a motion picture landmark. Notice gentleman Jim Corbett's short shorts. Peter Courtney wears longer fighting pants. When Corbett signed his contract and was paid $4,700 for his two days services, that made him the first motion picture actor ever to perform under contract. This is also the first film ever to make money. It grossed over $30,000.
Edison found that nothing convinces skeptics like cash. Motion pictures had arrived as a legitimate and profitable entertainment form. Watch Peter miss with this murderously intended punch. You can't fault Courtney's enthusiasm or Corbett's wardrobe. Corbett's venture into the movies was not his only try at acting. After winning the championship, he had gone directly into the leading role of this play as it toured the country. Gentleman Jim liked showing up this weaselly villain so much that he became reluctant to enter the ring. Freckled Bob Fitzsimmons, a balding ex-blacksmith, decided he was the man to call Corbett back into the ring. Already the 150-pound world middleweight champion, he put on enough weight to take on the ranking heavyweight fighters of his day. In the winter of 1896, Fitzsimmons fought this tough, cauliflower-eared sailor, Tom Sharkey. In the bout, Fitz was the victim of an unusual referee's decision. The biased referee was none other than one of the heroes of the Old West, Wyatt Earp. Referee Earp was rumored to have bet a lot of money on Sailor Sharkey. Old Wyatt may have looked like a picture hero in this pose, but when Fitzsimmons KO'd his man, Earp called it a foul, awarding the fight to Sailor Tom. Despite this setback, Fitzsimmons soon gained a chance at Corbett's title. On the eve of the fight, Bob predicted, Pretty Jim won't last ten rounds. This is a newspaper drawing of the fight scene. It looks like there was a standing room only crowd. Now be prepared for historical evidence of a credibility gap. The only existing photograph of the scene. Ordinarily, this miserable turnout would spell financial disaster. But in this unimposing ringside shed were three Veriscope cameras. Here are the movies of the Corbett Fitzsimmons fight, the first heavyweight championship contest ever filmed. That's Corbett on the right and the balding Fitzsimmons on the left. Most men are able to wear their bathrobes only while shaving. Gentleman Jim and Ruby Robert get double use from theirs. Gentleman Jim stands ready and seemingly impatient for round one to get underway. The bell rings and the scheduled 25 round bout begins. In the foreground, in the derby, is the timekeeper for the fight, Bat Masterson. The old frontier gunfighter had become a fixture in the fight scene because of his undisputed effectiveness in collecting guns and knives from the spectators. 14th round. Corbett, with his back to the camera, is well ahead on points and Fitzsimmons' nose is bleeding badly. But amazingly, the challenger is starting to press the fight. At this point, the old nitrate film starts to disintegrate. But a somewhat viewable version of the 14th round knockout was assembled from potato chip-like fragments. Watch Fitzsimmons on the right step under Corbett's left jab and land his own hard left to the champion's midsection. Gentleman Jim collapses. Corbett has evidently had the wind knocked out of him. He's still down when the referee completes the 10 count and Fitzsimmons raises his hand in triumph. In slow motion, let's see that all again. Here comes the left hook that Fitzsimmons on the right later called his solar plexus punch. The champion goes down to his knees. He tries to crawl over to the corner of the ring to pull himself up by using the ring ropes. Meanwhile, Fitzsimmons stalks around, keeping a close watch on Corbett's progress. The referee and timekeeper Masterson seem out of sequence, but it is obvious that Corbett will not beat the count. Gentleman Jim has lost his heavyweight crown. Corbett's stocky sparring partner, Jim Jeffries, wearing the white pullover, goes to the aid of the deposed champion after the fight. Remember that name, James J. Jeffries. A photographer posed this cooperative hunting hound to look up in awe at the newly splendid Ruby Robert Fitzsimmons. Bob looks justly proud as holder of the most cherished title in sports. 
But Fitzsimmons reign in the public eye was short-lived. World events on February 16, 1898 brought forth a rash of nationalism and the Spanish-American War was on. Here is Thomas Edison's film of American soldiers marching off to war. Watch this recruit vent his enthusiasm on his drum. But Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders and Admiral Dewey's fleet made it a very short war. A little over a year later, the returning Dewey was given a victory parade. Edison was again there to film it. The first decapitated carriage is supposed to have held Admiral Dewey. Obviously, Thomas Alva was still working out the kinks in his process. For the duration of the war, Fitzsimmons did not defend his title, and he was roasted for it by an unsympathetic press. Catch this cartoon, with various challengers depicted trying to hoist Ruby Robert into the ring. What he was doing was appearing in another of those plays that heavyweight champions of the time were expected to star in. Considering the acting talents of the average heavyweight fighter, it may well have been the most unusual play ever written. After two years, Fitzsimmons decided he would finally defend his title against James J. Jeffries. Jeffries had won his first 11 professional fights in a row, but he was considered slow and clumsy. Coney Island, New York, June 9, 1899. We see Fitzsimmons on the right shaking hands with a burly Jeffries. The first attempt to film a fight indoors failed when the special lights installed in the arena blew out in the first round. For 10 rounds, Fitz belted Jeffries with all his best punches. Then, in the 11th round, Jeffries landed a ponderous left. James J. Jeffries became the new champion. Only two days later, a reenactment of the bout was staged. Two actors, one visibly bald-headed, the other solidly chunky, played the principal roles. You quickly see these two gentlemen were devoted method actors. This recreation seems remarkably close to some of those pity-pat western saloon brawls later staged in Hollywood. The pseudo round ends and the referee takes the opportunity to get himself center screen in the movies. Back in the world of reality, Jeffries was demonstrating he was an uncomplicated man as well as a dogged fighter. He set about facing all the legitimate contenders. James J. first arranged to meet sailor Tom Sharkey, Wyatt Earp's old protege. Sharkey had given Jeffries a terrific battle before Jim had won the title. Their return match was the last important fight of the 1800s. It was also the first indoor fight successfully filmed. The special lights used were so hot, the fighter's hair was singed. The official movies of the fight were lost, but this version of the fight was pirated from inside a cigar box. That's right, shot with a camera that was hidden inside a cigar box. The quality isn't too clear but you can get an idea of the scene and the incredibly bright lights. A hat of a spectator will occasionally block out the foreground. Jeffries is the larger of the two in the slightly darker shorts. There's the spectator's hat. Jeffries now has his back to the camera. James Jeffries eventually won by decision over Sharkey in 25 hard-fought rounds. Now meet the same two men 25 years later, the year 1926, Jim Jeffries and a top-heavy Tom Sharkey. They were on a vaudeville tour together and agreed to stage a minor return match in this hallway for a camera. You can see why this was a slapstick circuit favorite. The 25 years has at least not affected the two oldsters' enthusiasm. President Teddy Roosevelt is busy pushing through his trust-busting policies and his plans for the Panama Canal. Two bicycle builders are regularly sending an odd-looking vehicle skyward at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The Wright brothers have quietly inaugurated the space age. Buffalo Bill, William F. Cody, is giving out frontier greetings at his touring Wild West show. 
The other major entertainment attraction was this chesty, big bustle dramatic actress, Lillian Russell. And James J. Jeffries poses in dainty pink tights, but nobody thinks of laughing. He fought both Corbett and Fitzsimmons again. He had taken on Jack Monroe twice. They had all ended lying flat on their backs, staring up through glazed eyes at the champion's impassive face. By mid-1905, Jeffries had no one left to fight. Now billed as the world's strongest human, James J. retired, leaving two hand-picked men to scrap for his title. This is Marvin Hart, the forgotten champion, the man who knocked out Jack Root to fill Jeffrey's vacated title. No film was taken. Frankly, nobody cared. These are the stumpy legs of a precocious fighter who felt that he should be the one to follow in Jeffrey's massive footsteps as undisputed heavyweight king. But at five feet seven inches tall, Tommy Burns was not too imposing a figure. Still on February 23rd, 1906, Tiny Tommy became the new heavyweight champion when he decisively defeated Marvin Hart in a 20-round fight. Light heavyweight champion Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, seen here with his tuxedoed valet, decided he too wanted in on the action. On November 28, 1906, just before the great Burns-O'Brien championship fight begins, the two fighters pose for the still cameras. This is the 10th round of the scheduled 20-round fight. Champion Burns, with his back to the camera, takes after the retreating O'Brien in what can only be described as the chase. Philadelphia Jack finally stops and throws a few punches. The referee will try to break the two fighters apart as they lock in a fervent clinch. The official is none other than the former champion, James J. Jeffries, who's come in from his alfalfa farm for a little action. So far, he hasn't gotten much. The 20th round. The fight has deteriorated into a wrestling match. Jeffries attempts to break another clinch but the overweight 300-pound former champion has trouble getting the fighters apart. He gives up as the fight ends. He raises both fighters' hands to signify he considers it a draw. The ecstatic O'Brien is carried off by his handlers, while Tommy walks to his corner, completely disgusted at the decision. Only six months later, Burns fought O'Brien again, and this time Tommy won decisively. He posed for this picture before he moved on to meet other challengers. In Colma, California, a lady prohibition worker tries to convert fight fans outside the stadium where Tommy Burns is to meet challenger Bill Squires. A patriotic vendor is peddling tomatoes, refreshment, or ammunition. Inside the stadium, the fighters are in the ring. As Bill Squires on the left, about to work himself into a fighting pose for the photographers. Again, the referee is stocky Jim Jeffries, who has turned overseeing fights into a lucrative sideline occupation. Round one. Announcer Billy Jordan shouts his famous, Let her go! Burns again is giving away four inches in height to his opponent. The balding Australian challenger is the three-to-one betting favorite because he came into this fight with the impressive record of 37 straight knockouts in 37 fights. But tiny Tommy Burns is soon getting home with his equalizer, his booming right hand. Squires goes down. But he's right up. The crowd thinks it's just a fluke knockdown. But Australian Jack hits the deck again. The spectators are stunned at seeing their three to one favorite on the canvas. He rises. But Tommy Burns soon plays his own special version of Goodnight Sweet Prince with some more explosive right-hand smashes. 
Squires is out cold. Flat on his back. The count by referee Jeffries is only a formality. A most convincing victory. There is pandemonium in the ring. In the fall of 1907, the increasingly dapper Tommy took his title overseas, matched to meet the heavyweight champions of the various European countries. Round one of a title fight in London, England. Burns's corner man rubs grease on Tommy's head before he goes out to battle Gunnar Moyer, the heavyweight champion of the British Isles. As you look at this rare film, you must notice something unusual. There is no referee inside the ring. In the British Isles, fight officials were permitted to preside from outside the ring if they could maintain control of the fight. In this case, the referee is in a third row ringside seat. The tenth round. The champion, Tommy Burns, is now definitely in charge. Moyer's face is bloody. The fight has become so rough that the referee, Eugene Corey, had to enter the ring and then remove his tuxedo jacket. Two right-hand blasts by Tommy and Gunner goes down. Gamely, the battered challenger struggles to his feet. Now watch Tommy try to finish it. Burns gets in with a delayed action punch. Moyer crumpled. Gunner again struggles to his feet. Not to be denied, Tommy sends the Englishman reeling against the ropes. Now watch the final dynamite right hand. Wham! Tommy Burns may be small, but he's the little giant of the heavyweight division. Gunner Moyer is in no condition to beat the count. Burns is won by a smashing 10th round knockout. Tommy then rubs in his victory by donning a jaunty Bristol cap and unwinding the American flag sash he had worn around his waist. During 1908, Tommy Burns went on to Ireland, France and Australia and decisively beat each of their champions. But the tough little champion's reign was drawing to a close. These massive arms belong to one of the most formidable fighting machines in boxing history. A man who was to stand overwhelmingly supreme above the other fighters of his era, Jack Johnson. In 1901, early in his career, a young Johnson tangled with one of the great old fighters of the bare knuckle era, Jewish Joe Choyinsky. Choyinsky quickly showing the young Johnson how much he had to learn. Here we see Jack looking very sad. Joyinsky had flattened him in three short rounds. But Joe himself doesn't look too happy about the verdict. The Galveston, Texas vigilantes had arrested both fighters for having engaged in an illegal prize fight. But Jack Johnson learned from this humbling affair. He teamed up with manager George Little and went off on an extended rampage through the heavyweight division. Seven years and 66 smashing victories later, he knew he was ready for the top. Johnson took to following Tommy Burns around the world. London, Paris, then finally all the way to Australia. There, 12,000 miles from home, champion Tommy Burns gave Jack Johnson the first chance a Negro ever got to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. Sydney, Australia, the day after Christmas, 1908. A large crowd has assembled to see if all they have heard about the phenomenal Jack Johnson is true. On this wooden stand is the means by which the ultimate verdict would be taken to the rest of the world. The two fighters could not agree on a way to divide movie earnings, and it was finally decided that no films would be taken. But on the day of the fight, promoter Hugh McIntosh secretly arranged to set up a movie camera anyway. Round one. Tommy Burns comes out from the near corner. He starts cautiously against a man who is already touted as the greatest defensive fighter of all time. Look at the six-inch height difference between the two men. Johnson smiles as he ties up the champion. 
Ringside reporters wrote that he taunted Burns, What you got, Mr. Tommy? You ain't showed me nothing. What you got, Mr. Tommy? Burns doesn't seem to know how to reach his tormentor. See the referee. He's promoter Hugh McIntosh, who has never refereed before and never will again. He had to officiate because the two fighters could not even agree on a referee. The eighth round. To most of the spectators, the fight is already a foregone conclusion. In a devastating flurry, Jack Johnson shows that he can handle champion Tommy Burns like a small child. Burns is tied up, his attempts at uppercuts completely nullified. Johnson has a big grin on his face as he continues to chat in the clinches. Is you having fun, Mr. Tommy? As the bell rings, Jack gives a friendly little wave to Burns. See you later, Mr. Tommy. Fourteenth round. Renowned sports writer Damon Runyon, who had come 12,000 miles to report the contest, was to write, not one second of any round could legitimately be scored for Burns. Finally, Johnson decides to put an end to the lopsided contest. He advances on the smaller man, and then suddenly, tiger-like, he attacks. Punches rain on the champion. Burns reels around the ring, helpless. At this very moment, the police stepped in and shut off the cameras. Seconds later, they stopped the fight. Jack Johnson was awarded the world's heavyweight championship on the spot. Back in the United States in 1909, Americans were in the throes of one of the most violent reform movements in history. In this film clip, we see the famous temperance leader, Carrie Nation, and two compatriots demonstrate their own brand of salvation, saloon busting with their trusty hatchets. Jack Johnson returned to the United States to this heated climate. He promptly scandalized the moral purists by setting up a saloon and marrying a white woman. It wasn't too long before there was a loud hue and cry for a white man to win back the title. On October 16, 1909, the first of the white hopes came forward. Called the Michigan Assassin, and often ranked as the greatest middleweight ever, Stanley Ketchell decided he was the man to dispose of Jack Johnson. The following movie is the only one in existence of the legendary Stanley Ketchell. First round. Ketchell answers the opening bell. The fight promoter, Tex Rickard, was very skeptical of signing what he correctly imagined to be a small middleweight. But Stanley Ketchell put on a pair of high-heeled cowboy boots, strutted up to the promoter and introduced himself, Mr. Rickard, I am Stanley Ketchell, and I can beat Jack Johnson. A surprised Rickard gave him his chance to do just that. Second round. The partisan fight fans have been shouting to Ketchell to flatten the grinning Johnson. Jack has other ideas as he scores the first knockdown. But Ketchell is a champion too, and he rises to continue. Ninth round. Ketchell is still trying to solve Johnson's style. Although now only 24 years old, Stanley has been fighting full-grown men professionally since he was 16. But the heavyweight champion seems to have matters so much in hand that he will keep Ketchell on his feet when he's about to fall. As a boy, Ketchell ran with a very rough crowd, including such notorious outlaws of the time as Cole Younger and Emmett Dalton. But it was hot blood, not bad company, that would prove Stanley's undoing. Exactly one year after this fight, Ketchell will be dead. An irate farmer put two bullets into his head after Stanley seduced his daughter. Twelfth round. It's been Johnson all the way. 
but the dogged middleweight has a surprise waiting for the overconfident heavyweight champion. Ketchell gets in with one of his renowned right hands. Johnson goes down, surprised to find himself put on the canvas by this little man. He's up at eight and attacks ferociously. Now Stanley drops like a stone. Johnson trips, but he rises quickly. The flabbergasted crowd watches the gallant middleweight counted out, lying flat on his back. Jack Johnson had Ketchell down and out only four seconds after he himself had been on the canvas. This dramatic victory only served to stir the cauldron of racial prejudice to greater heat. The White Hope era in boxing was only the reflection of a far more serious problem. This was a time of violently emotional reactions to racial relations. The Ku Klux Klan, active in America since the Civil War, was able to call on larger and larger membership roles here at the beginning of the second decade of the 20th century. A mere five years later, the Klan would be so powerful that it would be incorporated in many states. Amid the furor, an imperturbable Jack Johnson went on in his own colorful fashion, living in high style, giving exhibitions, and playing his bass fiddle on the vaudeville stage. The golden grin of Jack Johnson became synonymous with controversy to the American public. Out of this Nevada saloon had come the promotional genius who saw in this increasingly volatile situation a unique opportunity, an opportunity to arrange one of the most famous fights in boxing history. This is ex-gambler Tex Rickard, a man who it was said could con a Scotsman into spending his life savings to see a game of marbles. Tex persuaded the one man considered invincible to come out of retirement to try to win back the title for the white race. Former champion James J. Jeffries. That's James J. in the sporting cap. When the 35-year-old James J. signed to fight heavyweight champion Jack Johnson, he was committing himself to the gargantuan task of dropping 80 pounds of lard and getting in shape to go 45 three-minute rounds against one of the greatest fighters of all time. Promoter Tex Rickard always thought big. He started building the first stadium ever constructed specifically for a single sporting event. Racial solidarity was the catchword of the day as the fighters opened their training camps. Jeffrey stands with former champs, gentleman Jim Corbett on the left and John L. Sullivan. In this rarest of rare footage, the two old ring giants give a mock sparring demonstration. This is the only film of John L. Sullivan that even hints of his fabled ring prowess. There had been an 18-year-old feud between the two men. Thus, the two amicable oldsters demonstrate their mutual support of Jim Jeffries by shaking hands. To help get in shape, Jeffries spars with another old-time great, old bare-knuckle battler Joe Choyinsky. We see Joe wearing long white tights. And Jim Jeffries has unbelievably slimmed down to his former ring weight of 220 pounds. He once again looks like the formidable Boilermaker. The 4th of July, 1910. The streets of Reno, Nevada were in pandemonium. 30,000 people had come to see the fight being billed as the battle of the century. The President of the United States, William Howard Taft, was petitioned to be referee for the contest. The president reluctantly refused. Inside the stadium, champion Jack Johnson enters the ring first. He was superstitious about this point and made it a condition in all his fight contracts. Then the multitude of old hand grinder cameras recorded the arrival of the premier White Hope James Jeffries. The long-awaited fight is at last underway. Round one. The fight will be an endurance contest in the 101 degree heat. But Jim Jeffries is stale from his four-year layoff, while Johnson has had four non-title bouts this past year, including one with a fighter named Victor McLaughlin. McLaughlin later retired from the ring and went on to become an Oscar-winning Hollywood movie star. Notice referee and promoter Tex Rickard in his straw hat. 
Round 15. An hour has elapsed since the bout started. Jeff Reese sways on legs grown weary. Jack Johnson will leap in with slashing punches. The indestructible boilermaker, James J. Jeffries, will hit the canvas for the first time in his career. The former champion slumps like a tired old man, but gamely attempts to get up. Referee Tex Rickard holds Johnson away, but Jack smashes Jeffries through the ropes. Spectators rush to lift the fallen fighter. The champion drives him across the ring, flattens him for the third time. Referee Tex Rickard is counting, but the fight obviously is over. The greatest comeback attempt in the history of sports ends with Jim Jeffries humiliated in the bright Nevada sun. After the fight, Jeffries again retired to his alfalfa farm, this time for good. In later, calmer days, we see him joking with his old employer, Gentleman Jim Corbett. But the repercussions of the Johnson fight were to haunt Jeffries and the fight game for many years. As a result of race riots erupting in many cities after films of the contest were shown, Congress passed a law barring fight films from interstate commerce. For 28 years, this law prohibited Americans from seeing boxing movies. But on this peaceful country afternoon, it seems the two old friends are in a jovial mood. Jack Johnson also has his troubles. His saloon is shut down, and he is soon in money difficulties. Here, the badly out-of-shape champion resumes his training against Dynamite Kid Cutler. Cutler looks like he might have been an excellent overhand pitcher. That overhand right was thrown like a hand grenade. A few months later, Johnson signed to fight heavyweight contender fireman Jim Flynn, seen seated second from the right. Johnson agreed to let the promoters advertise the bout as a fight to the finish. Thus, the Johnson-Flynn fight is the last unlimited length contest in boxing history. The fight held in Las Vegas, Nevada, 4th of July, 1912, turned out to be one of the most wildly comic mismatches ever seen. This is the first round. The photographer has trouble keeping the fighters' heads in the picture. The motion picture camera still did not have a reliable viewing system. Aiming the lens was done almost by instinct. But we see Johnson demonstrate his Morse code prowess by landing a rat-a-tat-tat on Flynn's nose. It looks as though Flynn didn't get the message as he bores in again. The fifth round. Fireman Jim seems so confused by what looks like an impenetrable defense, Jack Johnson now simply holds him off with his left and belts him at will with his right. After taking a couple of extra hard Johnson uppercuts, Flynn jumps up and down trying to butt with his head. The referee warns Fireman Jim, who listens carefully. Then Jim returns to the fray. In the ninth round, Fireman Jim is at it again. Hippity hop goes this particularly hard-headed jackrabbit. The referee again warns Flynn, but gets an argument. Suddenly, a fourth figure enters the ring. It's the sheriff of Las Vegas. He stops the bout, awarding Johnson a ninth round decision. Amazingly enough, five years later, this same fireman Jim Flynn will score a first round knockout over a young up-and-coming fighter named Jack Dempsey. After the Flynn fight, 
Johnson got into more trouble with the law than he'd ever had inside the ring. The public furor for vice reform sweeping the country came to a head over Johnson's real and imaginary out-of-the-ring exploits. Here's Jack receiving a speeding ticket caught by an enterprising bicycle cop. Some speeder, huh? But more serious, in September of 1912, Johnson's white wife committed suicide. The outraged press howled for blood. Two months later, Johnson was slapped with a somewhat dubious charge of having violated the Mann Act, a federal law passed expressly to nab him. Despite the fact that Johnson had married the woman, he was convicted after a short trial. Johnson chose to jump bail and flee the country rather than face jail. Here's Jack Johnson in London in 1913 with his new wife. But he didn't stay long. English authorities, concerned about harming Anglo-American relations, soon told him he was not wanted. So he packed up his new bride and went to Paris. Here they are posing in the City of Light. In urgent need of funds, Johnson fought and won two lackluster fights and then signed to meet legitimate challenger Frank Moran on June 27, 1914. The French ring announcer didn't have a microphone. Rudy Valley would have been envious of this giant megaphone. The youngest referee in boxing history, 19-year-old Georges Carpentier, calls the fighters together for their instructions. The fifth round of a surprisingly close fight, Moran gets home with two good punches. The undaunted Johnson steps back and gives him a hearty round of applause. By the 12th round, it is obvious that Johnson was having trouble against the young challenger. Frank goes stumbling through the ropes in his eagerness to get at the tiring champion. Jack Johnson has constantly had to call on all his defensive skills to offset the aggressiveness of Moran. 20th round. Johnson holds a slight lead on the scorecard of the only official 19-year-old Georges Carpentier. The fight ends and Carpentier declares Johnson the winner and still heavyweight champion of the world. Back in the U.S., the quest for a white hope has built to a fever pitch. This skinny-legged 19-year-old tank town brawler named Kid Blackie was not even considered. But later, as Jack Dempsey, he would completely outshine all the momentary sensations of these turbulent times. The man eventually to get the call was a more impressive figure. Jess Willard, a six-foot-six-inch giant from Pottawatomie County, Kansas. Willard had been a circus strongman until he was 30 years old. Then flamboyant fight manager Tom Jones, seen here with Jess, nicknamed him the Potawatomi Giant and persuaded him to enter the fight game. Jess started training with but one thought in mind, a championship bout. Willard was not a clever boxer, but his immense strength and fantastic endurance made him a formidable opponent in those days when a fight could go as long as 45 three-minute rounds. 1915. A chubby Jack Johnson had run out of his money and his welcome in the war clouds that were inundating Europe. He agreed to fight Willard in Havana, Cuba. Here are Johnson and Willard being introduced in Havana one week before the fight. Johnson appears a dapper world traveler compared to farm boy Willard in his Sunday best suit. The timekeeper for the upcoming fight takes a bow. It's none other than Bat Masterson, the fabled Western gunfighter and marshal. As you can see, he must have used the toupee for his TV appearances. The morning of April 5th, Johnson, as usual, enters the ring first. At this time, Jack Johnson had not set foot in the United States in three years. Jess appears a fearsome figure dressed all in black. 
This is the man that an estimated 40 million Americans will be rooting for while getting telegraphed round-by-round round accounts of the forthcoming battle. In 1915, the fighters were required to weigh in just before the fight. The scales confirmed the expected 60-pound difference between champion and challenger. Another old-time custom, putting the gloves on in the ring. On Johnson's right is Sam McVeigh, another all-time great Negro heavyweight. The two men shake hands for the cameras, and one of the most controversial encounters in boxing history is about to begin. This is a still photograph of the scene at Havana Racetrack as it appeared during the fight. Not until 1967 was the complete version of the actual fight films discovered. As you watch, see if you believe that one of these two men threw the fight. The first round. The fight starts calmly. Both men aware that they may have to go 45 rounds in the sweltering tropical sun. Temperature at ringside, 103 degrees and rising. The bout was originally to be held in Mexico City, with Pancho Villa providing the money. Adverse developments in the Mexican Revolution forced the fight to be moved here to Cuba. Now see the fighters photographed by a special close-up camera. This is the first time film was taken from first row ringside. You can see a corner water bucket and a spectator's head in the foreground. Round 10 from a camera facing the grandstand. Johnson is showing the skeptics that he's still the best boxer in the world, scoring in flurries to gain a commanding point lead. But this fight is becoming an endurance contest, with conditioning the decisive factor. Johnson, in his seventh year as champion, second only to Sullivan in longevity, does not have time on his side. The 26th round. Already this is the longest fight ever held in the heavyweight division under Marquis of Queensbury rules. Willard is watching closely, realizing that his chance to reverse the momentum of the fight may come shortly. Suddenly Jess lashes out with a ponderous right. Johnson goes down. Referee Jack Welch counts, but the champion doesn't move. Eight, nine, ten. Jess Willard is the new heavyweight champion of the world, scoring a convincing 26th round knockout. The partisan crowd goes wild. They surround Willard. Now in slow motion, let's rerun this never-before-seen film of the actual knockout punch. Willard faints, then gets in with that explosive right. Johnson crumpling tries to pull Jess with him. Willard catches himself on the ropes and steps back. At first, the champion's legs are bent, but then they slip down as the champion passes out cold. Not even a muscle twitches as referee Welch completes the full count. Because of federal laws, no films of this fight were shown in the United States. Only this still photograph was seen by the American public. An ego-stung Johnson, despondent at losing the title he had held for seven years, used this photo to justify the claim that he had thrown the fight to Jess Willard. Jack said he was shading his eyes as he lay facing the bright Cuban sun. In 1920, Jack Johnson ended his lengthy exile and at long last returned to the United States. Here he gives himself up to federal deputy Billy Mitchell at the Mexican border eight years after he had jumped bail. Following what proved to be an embarrassingly triumphal cross-country railroad trip, 
Johnson was placed in Leavenworth Penitentiary for one year. While there, he held press conferences, gave exhibitions, and posed with his proud jailer. That's the warden in the white shirt. When released, Jack Johnson happily resumed his vaudeville career. He leads a jazz band in a style Duke Ellington could never emulate. In 1946, near the end of his life, Johnson plays the role of an Ethiopian general in a production of the opera Aida. Back in 1916, Willard began his heavyweight championship reign under the onus of Jack Johnson's false claim that Jess had won a rigged fight. Willard's first title defense in 1916 was a successful but uninteresting 10-round decision over the boxing veteran Frank Moran. Soon, however, boxing would go into a state of suspended animation. The reason, a spectacle bigger than any sporting event could provide, was in the middle of its four-year run in Europe. The First World War was approaching a climax, and 1917 drew American doughboys into European trenches. In the pitch-in spirit of the time, former heavyweight champion, gentleman Jim Corbett, now a well-preserved 50 years old, put on khakis and boots to make an army training film on the manly art of self-defense. His balding opponent is Kid McCoy, who'd been the first light heavyweight champion when that division originated back in 1901. The two former greats give their own priceless advice as to how to beat the German armies. In slow motion, let's see Corbett's tricky pirouette again. Luckily, by the end of 1918, this advice became unnecessary. The war had ended. The leaders of the four victorious powers met to decide peace treaty terms. Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, Lloyd George of Great Britain, and Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Meanwhile, an ecstatic America returned to its traditional enjoyment of sports and fun with renewed zest and optimism. Master promoter Tex Rickard decided it was time to find an exciting new challenger for Jess Willard's heavyweight crown. His choice? This smiling young knockout puncher, Jack Dempsey. All sorts of stunts were arranged to get young Dempsey into the public eye. One most notable was this high-priced totem pole of talent. On the bottom, Charlie Chaplin, the most brilliantly inventive comedian of his time. Next is Douglas Fairbanks Sr., virile leading man who will grace swashbuckling silent films for years. On top, young Jack Dempsey, who will go on to create his own legend as the Manassa Mauler. In a classic non sequitur film sequence, the three men team up for a slapstick vignette. Chaplin seems involved in the music. Fairbanks comes flying to the picture. Now Dempsey joins the melee. It's a fight to the finish. really effective build-up, Dempsey's explosive in-the-ring style made him his own best press agent. In the seven bouts Jack fought before he took on Willard, he had seven knockouts, all in two rounds or less. With Dempsey as colorful challenger, promoter Rickard proceeded with arrangements for the fight. Tex had an immense wooden stadium built in Toledo, Ohio to house the huge crowds he expected. The cost? $100,000 worth of green lumber. As it turned out in the hot sun, 
the sap from the unseasoned wood ruined many a spectator's double-breasted suit. 8 a.m., the 4th of July, 1919. The first fans arrived for the fight to be held that afternoon. Ticket prices were high, particularly since the average American makes just $10 a week. That means many of these fans put in six weeks of work for their ringside seats. 2,000 women, including actress Ethel Barrymore, are seated in a special section fenced off by barbed wire. This forever ended the custom of all male fight crowds. When Dempsey comes in the ring, the temperature is a torrid 112 degrees. Willard arrives, gracefully acknowledges the crowd's enthusiastic welcome. The symbolic heavyweight championship belt is displayed. The fighters meet in the center of the ring to pose for the cameras. Jess Willard does not seem to be in the rock-hard shape he was against Jack Johnson four years earlier. But what a difference in size between champion and challenger. Moments before the opening bell, Dempsey rubs rosin on his feet. First round. The bell rings, but no one hears it because of the clamor of the crowd. Jess Willard stands confused, looking around. There's a second bell. The most exciting first round in heavyweight history is underway. The fight starts calmly, but keep an eye on Dempsey. Although outweighed by almost 80 pounds, he has bet $10,000 at 10 to 1 odds that he will knock the champion out in the first round. Four dynamite punches and Willard is down for the first time in his eight-year career. The crowd surges to its feet. When the champion rises, Dempsey leaps after him, drives Jess toward the ropes. Willard goes down for the second of what will prove to be seven knockdowns. Dempsey pounces to the attack again, rains punches on the floundering champion. There was no neutral corner rule in 1919, and Dempsey is allowed to stand over the fallen fighter, ready to swing as soon as both knees leave the canvas. A crashing blow to the rim sends Jess down again. Willard desperately tries to fend off the raging challenger. Dempsey lands more brutal punches. The champion staggers across the ring. He's down again. The referee pushes Dempsey away. Willard pulls his battered body erect, only to be floored for the seventh time. Ali Picard is counting over the incredibly game champion. The bell rings, saving Willard from a first round knockout, but no one hears it because of the fantastic uproar. Dempsey leaves the ring thinking he has won the championship and his 10 to 1 side bet, a $100,000 payoff. Meanwhile, Willard's handlers attend to him, desperately trying to ready Jess for the second round. With jaw broken and two ribs cracked, the battered champion is led to his corner. Dempsey's manager, Jack Doc Kearns, runs over and starts screaming after the young fighter. Jack, come back! Jack, come back! Dempsey returns and the fight continues. The mammoth Willard not only lasts through round two, but he's still on his feet here in round three. Dempsey is relentless on the attack. But in the blazing Toledo sun, Jess Willard is proving what is meant by the saying, he went out like a champion. After the third round, Willard's handlers insist that he not answer the fourth round bell. 
Jack Dempsey forges an instant legend as the Manassa Mole. He has won the heavyweight championship in one of the most savage battles in ring history. Dempsey then goes off for a vacation in the country. In what will become the standard newsreel footage of boxing champions, here's Dempsey in his version of the pastoral scene. America is entering the Roaring Twenties. Prohibition puts no damper on the age of fun and flappers. Business was booming, all kinds of business, including bootlegging and racketeering, as was being murderously demonstrated by Chicago millionaire gang lord, Scarface Al Capone. Dempsey moved easily into the giddy frenzy of this swinging decade. He legitimately could be called the prototype of the sporting idol. His explosively aggressive ring style put his fights among the most exciting battles in boxing history. His poor boy past fit perfectly into the Horatio Alger storybook mold. And he had the most colorful boxing manager of all time, Jack Doc Kern, seen here at Dempsey's right. The third member of this potent box office team was, of course, promoter Tex Rickard. In 1921, after two successful but unexciting defenses, Tex decided to put Dempsey against a genuinely popular challenger, the light heavyweight champion of the world, Frenchman Georges Carpentier. And one of the most successful promotions in the history of boxing gets underway. Tex Rickard immediately sets about building another of his green lumber arenas in Jersey City, New Jersey. First World War hero Carpentier arrives in the United States by boat. The newspapers play up the Frenchman's matinee idol's looks, as well as his potent right-hand punch. Here in a publicity gimmick, Georges does some fancy footwork. Then the orchid man gallantly offers an open shot at his chin and counts himself out. Dempsey, on the other hand, was portrayed as the villain of the piece. The champion's lack of a war record became the springboard for all kinds of adverse publicity. Here, Jack spars with Midget Smith, future bantamweight champion of the world. David and Goliath obviously had nothing on this mismatch. July 2nd, 1921. Police reinforcements arrive at the stadium at Boyle's 30 acres. Inside, Carpentier enters the ring to receive an hysterical ovation from the keyed-up crowd. The heavyweight champion of the world arrives with his entourage. A ferocious-looking Jack Dempsey with two days' growth of beard. Meanwhile, incredulous tellers were totaling the gate receipts. The total was $1,800,000, the first million-dollar gate in boxing history. The two men shake hands for the cameras. Round one. The fight starts two hours earlier than scheduled. The wooden stands were filled to overflowing by noon, and Tex Rickard became worried that they would collapse before he got the fight underway. The Dempsey Carpentier fight was the social event of 1921. The list of people who attended reads like a society and entertainment world who's who. Rockefeller, Ford, Vanderbilt, Whitney, Gould, Harriman, Baruch, Astor, Flo Ziegfeld of Follies fame was there. So was John Ringling of the Circus, Colonel Jacob Rupert of the Yankees, George M. Cohan, Al Jolson. It was the in place to be on July 2nd, 1921. Dempsey, as usual, is pressing the fight, using his greater weight and power. Round two, Carpentier gets home with his best weapon, his potent right hand.
thinks he is hurt. The crowd goes wild as George tries to press his advantage. American fight fans across the country were listening to the fight on the first live coast-to-coast -coast radio hookup. They heard how the granite jaw champion survived. Fourth round, Dempsey has taken charge. George misses with a desperate flurry. Dempsey is after him. A sharp left, right, and Parker J is down. The Frenchman looks like he's out cold, but jumps up at nine. Two more punches, and George is down again. This time, he does not rise. The Manasseh Mauler has knocked out his 11th opponent in a row. Dempsey emerged as one of the two greatest celebrities of the times. The other was this fancy Dan, sometime amateur boxer. To legions of American women, he was known as the demon lover of their dreams, Rudolph Valentino. He evidently had a grade A wooing style, uh, judging from this young lady's reaction. Dempsey may have caused a few heart throbs himself, with publicity pictures like this dramatically posed shot. This is Shelby, Montana, where Dempsey fought his fourth title defense. The businessmen of Shelby had decided to put their little town on the map by staging a heavyweight championship prize fight. But they didn't have a Tex Rigger to run their promotion. And at fight time, only 8,000 people were in the spanking new stadium. Because of the $200,000 guarantee given to Dempsey before the fight could go on, the little town of Shelby went completely bankrupt. Many of the potential crowd seemed to be on this hillside a half a mile away from the stadium. Inside before the fight, challenger Tom Gibbons enters the ring in a colorful bathrobe. Dempsey is his usual business-like self. Gibbon's plan is to box and stay out of range of the harder-punching champion, banking on outpointing Dempsey to win the decision. As the crowd, including many rowdy, pistol-packing cowboys, jeered, the fighters pose in the middle of the ring. First round. Gibbons, in the dark trunk, starts out with his defensive fight plan. He has never been knocked out or even floored during his 12-year career. Backs away, ties up the champion. Fifteenth round. Tommy Gibbons has planned his strategy too cautiously. Dempsey is far ahead on points because of his aggressiveness. The fight is over. Jack retains his title by a clear-cut decision. The champion, still wearing his boxing trunks, boards a train out of Shelby a mere 20 minutes after the fight ends. Gibbons, who was to be paid a percentage of the gate, never receives a penny for his losing 15-round effort. Dempsey, who was out of shape for the Gibbons fight, goes to his country training camp to get ready for upcoming matches. A proud news cameraman gets this exclusive footage of Jack and his entourage setting off on a morning workout. Jack dissuades an enthusiastic but older friend from running with him. Pops doesn't seem to be too happy about it. This kind of moving shot is most unusual for the time, and it represents an attempt at bringing newsreel footage up to the level of sophistication comparable with the burgeoning Hollywood film industry. 1923. Luis Angel Firpo, the wild bull of the Pampas, arrives in the United States ready to destroy Dempsey. Six feet three inches tall, 220 pounds of explosive Argentinian. Undefeated, winner of 22 fights in a row, all but four by knockout. On the night of the fight, September 14, 1923, 80,000 fans crowded into the polo grounds in New York City. It was Tex Rickard's second million-dollar gate. 
famous ring announcer Joe Humphreys introduces the fighters. In just seconds, Furpo and champion Jack Dempsey will collide in the most spectacular fireworks display ever to take place inside a boxing ring. Round one begins. With two savage brawlers in there, everyone expects lightning to strike. And they are not to be disappointed. Dempsey gets in first, giving the Argentinian his own special version of an American welcome. Jack Dempsey tastes blood, and as usual, he wants to end it here and now. Purple is down again, but still the champion does not dream that in the next two minutes, he will be locked in one of the most unbelievable seesaw contests in sporting annals. Dempsey seems to be having it all his way, as Furpo is down again. But Jack is about to taste the power and strength that allows the Argentinian to continue to absorb such a barrage. A blunderbuss right catches the unsuspecting champion coming in and floors him for a one count. An enraged Dempsey storms right back. Furpo drops. That is the seventh of what will prove to be a record nine first round knockdown. There is number eight. Dempsey charges in for the kill, but the giant challenger fends him off with a desperate flurry of wide arm punches. Dempsey retreats before the sudden onslaught. A right hand from the bleachers, and Dempsey is out of the ring. The first time in the history of pugilism that a heavyweight champion suffers such indignity. But Dempsey is boosted back into the ring by ringside reporting. And the struggle goes on. Dempsey's fabled jaw again stands him in good stead as he hangs on through the fog. There's the bell. Somehow both fighters have survived this most savage first round. Round two. Dempsey comes out fresh, and the fans brace themselves, wondering what possibly can be coming next. Dempsey is getting off. Furpo will try to fend off Dempsey with another overhand right, but the champion now seems definitely in charge. Two pulverizing left hooks, and Louis Angel Furpo is down for the 11th knockdown. Eight, nine, ten, and out. one of the most explosive bouts in ring history. Jack Dempsey, now a world-renowned celebrity, makes the logical shift to Hollywood, home of movie stars. To ready himself to compete with his glamorous neighbors, Jack gets his nose trimmed. Before, after. Give us a profile, Jack. Thanks. Soon afterward, Jack began to accept various movie and stage roles. Jack applied plenty of enthusiasm, but he seems to lack a little of Valentino's class as a romantic lead. While Dempsey was capitalizing on his heavyweight title, another boxer with championship aspirations was cutting his way through the best fighters of the time. Ex-Marine Gene Tunney. Gene manages to keep a straight face as he goes through some serious muscle making. By 1924, the fighting Leatherneck has swept through the light heavyweight division, beating such all-time greats as Battling Levinsky and Harry Greb. To make his dramatic appearance on the heavyweight scene, Gene signed to fight Georges Carpentier in 1924. The tenth round. Watch Gene Tunney on the right give a demonstration of his accurate punching.
Carpentier is getting a more severe pummeling than Jack Dempsey gave him three years earlier. But the Frenchman refuses to go down under the barrage. George not only survives the 10th round, but he is still on his feet in the 14th. George backs Tunney toward the near ropes. Gene lashes out with a paralyzing body blow. Frenchman sinks to the canvas as the bell rings. Round 15, but Carpentier cannot continue. The fight goes into the record book as a 15th round knockout victory for Tunney. While Tunney takes a giant step into the heavyweight picture, Dempsey is taking another kind of step, that of matrimony. Here is Jack with his new bride, Hollywood movie star Estelle Taylor. About to leave for their European honeymoon in 1925, Jack and Estelle literally give news photographers a big scoop. So Dempsey's only fight in 1925 was this backyard contest. Jack gives his best, but a smashing punch from Tommy the Toddler's dynamite right hand puts the champ down for the count. The winner. Meanwhile, Gene Tunney resolutely moves ahead to earn his chance at the title. In this newsreel shot, Gene, in the middle, is doing road work, part of his intensive training for his upcoming fight with brilliant boxer Tommy Gibbons, only man in six years to last the limit with champion Jack Dempsey. The 12th round. Tunney on the left, boxing magnificently, is far ahead on points. Watch Gene's accurate jab flick out, disrupting what is left of Tommy Gibbons' fight plan. Gibbons is backing, trying to last. Tunney lands a perfectly timed right, and Gibbons is down. A referee screams out the count. Tommy is up, but Gene immediately floors him again. It's all over. Tommy Gibbons is knocked out for the first time in his brilliant 14-year career. By 1926, Jack Dempsey has not defended his title in three years. To quell the mounting public clamor, Jack signs with Tex Rickard to defend against a suitable opponent in the not too far distant future. Early in 1926, promoter Tex Rickard, seated on Tunney's left, decides that Gene is the right challenger at the right time. With Tunney's signing, the stage is set for the epic Dempsey-Tunney battle. Gene seems so happy with the turn of events that he kids Tex about the part in the middle of the old gambler's slick down hair. On September 23, 1926, challenger Gene Tunney steps into the ring in Philadelphia's sesquicentennial stadium. Champion Dempsey arrives to be greeted by the roar of 125,000 excited fans, the largest paid crowd ever to attend a single sporting event. Rain starts to fall as the fighters are introduced, but there is no thought of postponing the fight. With his third million dollar gate already in hand, Tex Rickard is going to stage this match come hell or high water. Round one. Dempsey, as usual, starts pressing the fight. At first, the challenger seems cautious, but watch closely the man who has already proved himself to be the finest boxer of the era. combination. The immense crowd is surprised that Tunney has obviously planned to take the fight right to Dempsey. Through the first nine rounds, as the rain continues to fall, Tunney continues to pile up points. By the tenth round, Dempsey's only chance to hold his title is to score a last-minute knockout. But this isn't the thunderous Dempsey that rallied to destroy Bill Brennan and Louis Furpo years earlier. 
This is a tiring champion, repeatedly being beaten to the punch. It looks like Dempsey is the one in danger of being KO'd. Tony gets off another combination. demonstrated this kind of counter-punching prowess all through this 10-round fight. It's over. Both fighters stand waiting in the now driving rain. No fans have left as everyone awaits the decision. When it comes, it's no surprise. Gene Tunney is the new heavyweight champion. Congratulated by gracious Jack Dempsey. The new champion brought a new tone to boxing, much as Corbett did 35 years before. Tunney was considered an intellectual. Indeed, he did hobnob with some of the world's leading eggheads. That bearded fellow is the brilliant George Bernard Shaw. A proud New York City gives the boy who grew up in Manhattan's Greenwich Village a boisterous welcome. A ticker tape parade in the best Jimmy Walker style. The steps of City Hall. That's Dapper Jimmy on Tunney's right. Then it was off to the training farm for some horse play, or rather, cow play. In May 1927, the reign of the new champion was eclipsed by the achievement of another clean cut young American who had a date with a machine and an ocean. The machine, the spirit of St. Louis. The ocean, the Atlantic. The man, Charles A. Lindbergh. Here he leaves from Newfoundland for the last big 3,000 mile hop. After this historic and momentous flight, thousands of screaming Parisians assemble in the middle of the night at Orly Field to greet the weary flyer. In 1927, new fighters also were clamoring for the public's attention. One of the most colorful newcomers was the Boston Gob, Jack Sharkey. A temperamental but explosive fighter, Sharkey shows his devastating punching power, flattening Jim Maloney in a much talked about fight. Jim tries to rise, falls again, and then tumbles flat on his face, out cold. Tex Rickard then comes up with another promotional natural, a match between the colorful Sharkey and ex-champ Dempsey, with the winner to challenge Tunney for his first defense of the heavyweight championship of the world. Tex Rickard sits between Dempsey and Sharkey as they sign for a July 21st, 1927 bout that will be Rickard's fourth million dollar promotion. Then the two men shake hands. And on July 21st, 1927, they do come out fighting. First round. Dempsey on the left gets belted by a beautiful left hook and a follow-up volley of punches. but his now famous granite jaw stands him in good stead as he holds on. The seventh round, Dempsey on the left is far behind on points. He starts going after Sharkey's body. Dempsey wails away at Sharkey's midsection. As the younger man turns to the referee, Dempsey whips in a left hook to Sharkey's exposed chin. He's writhing on the canvas, claiming Dempsey punched low. But Sharkey had committed boxing's most grievous sin, leaving himself unprotected. Dempsey wins by a seventh round knockout. The loser will go on to have his day, however. Five years later, Jack Sharkey will himself win the heavyweight championship. But for now, Dempsey has earned another shot at Tunney. They signed to fight on September 22, 1927. That date, strangely enough, caused the sporting world's attention to shift from another momentous occurrence. Babe Ruth's spectacular drive to reach the record total of 60 home runs for a single baseball season. Early on the morning of September 22, we see an empty Soldier's Field, Chicago, Illinois. 
But just 12 hours later, over 100,000 fans, a live crowd greater than any attendance at any baseball game, watches as the first round of one of boxing's most controversial fights begins. Tunney is wearing the light-colored trunks. The fifth and final million-dollar gate under the promotional reigns of Tex Rickard, this fight sets the record that may never be broken. Two million, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars official gross receipts from a live gate. Champion Gene Tunney will receive a cool one million dollars for 40 minutes work. The fight itself follows a pattern similar to the first match. That is, until the fateful seventh round. Dempsey lands a potent right-hand counter, follows up with a series of seven devastating punches. Tunney goes down for the first time in his career. Dempsey stays near the fallen fighter, but referee Dave Barry points for Jack to move to a neutral corner. Only then does he begin the count. Is Tunney dazed, or is he wisely taking full advantage of these precious extra seconds? Tunney is up at the referee's count of nine. Now, watch that sequence again in freeze action with a stopwatch on the knockdown. Tunney has just hit the canvas, and we start the watch at zero. Jack has forgotten the new rule. The count does not begin until he gets to a neutral corner. Instinctively, Dempsey stays nearby. Five seconds have elapsed before referee Barry is ready to begin the count. Gene looks hurt, dazed as the count begins. But here at the official count of four, when nine seconds have actually elapsed, he is looking at the referee and picks up the numbers. You be the judge. Could Tunney have risen at this point? At the referee's count of nine, but after 14 seconds have elapsed, Gene is getting off the canvas. Then unabashedly, he gets on a bicycle to stay away from the rampaging Dempsey, who had scored only after 17 rounds of maddening frustration. round, Tunney has fully recovered. In slow motion, watch him get in with a right that drops Dempsey for a one count. Notice here the referee incorrectly will start his count immediately after Jack's knee touches and before Gene could get to a neutral corner. Round 10. Tunney has taken complete charge. Bruised and exhausted, Jack Dempsey seems at the verge of being knocked out for the first time in 10 years. There's the bell. The fight is over. Gene Tunney overwhelmingly the winner. But the long count gives sporting buffs something to discuss whenever they get together. Dempsey lost, yet he had won the greatest victory of his life. An adoring public took him to their hearts as he retired from the ring. Here's Jack Dempsey resuming his career in the theater, about to go through scenes with his actress wife, Estelle Taylor. As the years passed, Dempsey devoted his considerable skills and energies to many enterprises. One was this restaurant. This will bring me as much success as these old boxing gloves. While the cornerstone is being laid for his new eatery, a little comedy of errors develops over the traditional bottle of champagne. Say, Jack, why not uh, give those gloves to a museum? They're very historic instead of in a cornerstone. Well, I'll tell you, they brought me luck in the fight game. I think they're going to bring me luck in this new restaurant. I hope they do, Jack. Good Thank luck you to you. Thank you very much. 
July 1928, and Tunney was involved in his second title defense. His opponent was New Zealand's Tom Heaney. The heavyweight champion is at the peak of his boxing skills as he finishes the challenger. Tunney wins by an 11th round knockout. After this fight, Tunney called the press to a special news conference. His was a startling announcement to give up his title and retire from the ring. The only precedent for this action was Jim Jeffries retiring undefeated way back in 1905. But you remember, Jim returned to the ring to challenge Jack Johnson. Gene Tunney retired and stayed retired, ending a truly brilliant career that included only one loss in 76 fights. Soon after his retirement, Tunney married a beautiful society heiress and completed the Horatio Alger transition from humble Greenwich Village beginnings to millionaire gentlemen. Tunney and his new wife pose for photographers as they board ship for a European honeymoon. Tunney's retirement coincided with the end of a fantastic era. Soon after, on January 6, 1929, mercurial promoter Tex Rickert went to his last reward and was given resplendent funeral ceremonies. It was said in certain quarters, that it didn't matter whether the old gambler was going to heaven or hell, for he was sure to arrange a match with the other side soon after he arrived at either place. In the fall of 1929, the stock market crash made the easy money million dollar gates of the affluent Roaring Twenties a thing of the past, at least until a new prosperity could be attained many years later. In 1957, the 30th anniversary of the historic Battle of the Long Count Dempsey and Tunney, both still remarkably handsome and vigorous, meet in Soldier's Field in Chicago. Getting into a makeshift ring set in the same spot in which they had fought, they engage in a mock sparring session. To acknowledge the passing of years, they delight the crowd by demonstrating that any fight now would only be a waltz compared to their earlier clashes. Is it possible to capsule this epic 47-year period from John L. Sullivan to Gene Tunney? Yes, this was truly the era of legendary champions. But can these champions be rated in order of greatness? It would be difficult. It would mean comparing men who fought under vastly different circumstances. But let's hear the opinion of one man whose judgment in this respect must be highly regarded. The man, Tiny Tommy Burns, the former heavyweight champion who tells his own personal ratings. Rating the heavyweight champions of the world since James J. Jeffries' time, I must say Jeffries was the best. Then comes Jack Johnson, the world's greatest defensive fighter, who won the title from me. Bob Fitzsimmons is next. Then Jack Dempsey, that millionaire fighter, or million dollar fighter, rather. James J. Corbett, Gene Tunney, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, who beat Bob Fitzsimmons after Jeffries had retired, and then Jess Willard. As to myself, you may rate me where you like. So boxing had come to the end of an era, the era of legendary champions, an era that would never be surpassed. But the years and champions that were to come after Tunney's retirement were to hold their own special excitements and controversy. The Black Eulen, Max Schmeling. The Boston Gob, Jack Sharkey. The Ambling Out, Primo Carnera. Livermore Larifer. Max Bear, the Cinderella Man, Jim Braddock, the Brown Bum, Joe Lewis, the Acknowledged Great, and the highly controversial champions that span the years to this very day. Someday, in the distant future, Perhaps they too will become legendary champions.